Bulletin, Channel 55. American Public Television presents the following program in high definition. Spot where you can find that particular product. On a trip into the lands of the native Opatas of Sonora, Mexico, the adventurous traveler must cross four sierras by winding roads. Oh my. Conquer the Cruz del Diablo. Survive the fiery effects of Bacanora. All with the hope of being rewarded with the woven jewels of the ancient Opata descendants. Funding for The Desert Speaks was provided by Desert Program Partners, a group of concerned viewers making a financial commitment to the education about and preservation of our desert areas. I've heard it said that the hat makes the man or the woman. In one case, hats constitute the remnants of an entire culture. The descendants of the vanished Opatas of Sonora, Mexico, have been making fine hats for centuries, woven from palm leaves. Ten years ago, they were weaving the hats. I want to go see if they still are. There's only one hat store of any significance left in the largest city in the state of Sonora. If anyone knows if Opa the hats are still being made, they will. In the state capital of Hermosillo, things have changed considerably in the last 30 years. At that time, you couldn't walk down these streets without seeing a sea of cowboy hats. And the theme was cowboy and rodeos. Today, hats are pretty well gone. The men go out in the hills to collect the palm fibers and the women weave. So these hats are from Nacori, Buenavista, and South? Yes, South de Ures. That's why we buy them to sell in our store. They last longer and we take better care of them because they are works of art. This hat was made from palma pelada, while the hat you're holding was made from a native palm. We are very concerned about strengthening the culture of these hats. It's a means for the local people to sustain themselves economically, as well as preserve the culture and tradition that has existed for many years. Palm hats are the pride of Sonora. Our wish is for every head in the entire world to wear one of these hats. Oh, I love, see, and now that I know that there are hats to be found in Nacuri Chico and El Saúl de Ures, it's time to go there and find them. Gracias y adiós. My friend Alberto Borges from Hermosillo has offered to take me on the long drive east to Buena Vista. The Opatas really were an industrious, famous people all over the region and uh, outside the region for their uh, excellent crops and the use of land. We got to go over this this long range drop down into the the valley of the Rio Moctezuma, and then we go up again to uh, drop down into the valley of the Babispe. Then we go really up through that place called the Cruz del Diablo. That's Devil's Cross, and it's something. We go up, 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 and drop down to Baca de Wichi, up again and drop down to Nacuri, where we'll find the weavers. Sierra after Sierra after Sierra, many ranges. And the more you go to the east, the higher the mountains. Most of the Opataria isn't this wet. It was pretty deserty. This is almost wet enough to be a tropical forest. This is this valuable lac, is it not? Yes. 
is shellac. It's a shellac, but is it, it's Goma Sonora. Uh, in the past, it was uh, very common and was used for everything that needed a, a luster uh, and, and highly protective finish. So it actually is an animal. And uh, what we use is the shell of the animal. So the name Chelak is very appropriate. Because <laughs> it's a shell. I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, upstream from here is where they had the, the very western bunch of the Opus had their villages. And it's a, it's a very lush place. It's mostly desert where they had their villages, but this, this pass is lush. This is one of the areas where tropical plants reach their northernmost distribution. And uh, many of these tropical plants don't go farther north. Be that as it may, I look at these, these great trees, not a single palm here. We've got to go to the different mountains to get the palms. It is said that the Opata was one of the primitive groups inhabiting Sonora. And uh, a portion of the tribe of this group called themselves Sonora. So they embody the Sonoran traditions. They lived in the desert valleys uh, of the Sonoran desert, very close to the mountains in the Sierra Madre. And they used both habitats. They exploited the resources that the desert contained, as well as the riches of the Sierra Madre. When the Spaniards arrived, the Apaches were making warfare to most groups living in northern Sonora. So the Opatas decided to ally with the Spaniards. And in doing so, they signed their disappearance, they signed their doom. Uh, the Opatas completely disappeared. And for sure, if you look at the people in this area, they all carry the handsome mark of the Opata uh, culture. Of the more than 200 linguistically distinct indigenous groups in Mexico, a few have vanished completely. But even they have left some traces of their cultures, like the palm hats. It's not until we get inside Opata country, the Opateria, that we find the first palm trees. Well, this, this is the right size little palma. Somebody's been in here. Good. Macheting. Probably they use these leaves for roof thatching. Yeah, they uh, need a, a ramada. Yeah, a ramada, you bet. Here, this is the uh, what they call the cojo, which the, uh, the ladies cut off to, to do their weaving. Yes, the cojo is the, is the leaf bud. As is, in the very early stages of development. And it's very tender and, uh, and uh, thin. The, the leaf is really nice to weave. Oh, you can actually see the little sections of the palm leaf that haven't unfolded, and that's why you call it a bud. Right. <laughs> of course, great. Terrific. Uh, this species of saval is identified by the shape of this central vein. This is a structure where the leaf fans out. In the date palm, each individual leaflet come out of this central vein, so we have a traditional usual form of leaf. While Washingtonia that grows in Sonora and Arizona has this vein much shortened and uh, from this bottom it, uh, uh, the whole leaf fans out. I'm going to try to cut out a coil here to take to the ladies. In the just in case they don't have any. Sometimes I know they're hard to get. We'll see how hard the cutting is. Now you say that this, uh, this stuff has something in it that dulls the blade? Yes, most, most palm trees, but particularly in this region, do have uh, these uh, uh, silica deposits that will just, just uh, tear off any blade. Well, I, I hope not, although, boy, it is not the easiest thing in the world to cut. Next time I'm bringing a Somebody with a machete. For desert peoples, desert rivers are a matter of life and death. The Babispe River is probably the most important and reliable river in all of the Obata country. 
The Opata villages along the river were founded more than 400 years ago. Today they retain their old names even if the Opatas are gone. Places like Wasabas, Oputo, Baserac, and Babispe. The people have long vanished, but their names stay on behind them. Being so close to the Spaniards, the Opata uh, were slowly absorbed by the Spanish culture. So their language uh, vanished, but they left uh, many, many place names, many artifact names, uh, and a very rich culture, like the making of sombreros. The date palm, a Mediterranean crop, was brought by the Spaniards to the Americas. It did not replace native palms. Native palms offer much more than the date palm, despite the delicious fruit that are dates. Native palms offer leaves for touching, trunks that are highly durable for construction. They offer wonderful fibers to make uh, heads. So date palm could not compete with native palms. Our first stopover on the way into the Sierras is in the isolated but renowned village of Bacadewachi. The Jesuits were expelled from the New World in 1767, and after that, uh, Franciscans came in, and it was under their leadership that the church here was built. But it was with Opata labor and the excellence of their, uh, their artisan abilities that this church was really constructed, and they're the ones, I think, that should, should get the credit. Opatas really added a lot of their perception of the world to the facade of this church that, unfortunately, uh, was heavily affected by the late 1800 earthquake that toppled down several churches in the region. I've driven a lot around Sonora, bumming around mostly, but I know that this is the road up to the Cruz del Diablo, La Cruz del Diablo, is probably known as the scariest ride in all of Sonora. And your grandfather was in charge of building it. He was head of the highway department at that time, probably about uh, 50 years ago. And he was very proud of being on that enterprise. This is the place where you make up your mind whether you're going to continue or not. Wow. That's a good eh, a thousand feet down. It sort of feels like the end of the world, this La Cruz del Diablo, which means the Devil's Cross. Well, we're actually right in the middle of Wapata country, so they had some pretty rough territory to deal with. Once the Apaches started coming into this territory at the end of the 17th century, about 1690, they raided the Opata villages just brutally. The Opatas had to turn to the Spaniards for help. And probably the reason the Apaches came was twofold. The Opatas worked in the mines. The Apaches didn't like the mines. The Opatas had horses, and they'd make raids for horses. It must have been really tough. All the time you had to be on your defensive. And that started for sure the decline of the Opata, pushing them to integrate more and more with the, the Spanish society. Yeah, exactly. They become mestizos. The imprint of the Spaniards remains not only in their architecture, but also in the continued use of the distillation process, locally honored in a moonshine called Bacanora. You can find some in every small town, wherever you find guys hanging around. We're going to drive up the road away to find the uh, clandestine still that's still illegal to uh, produce Bacanora or this uh, moonshine without a license. And my understanding is that no self-respecting himador, which is what they call the moonshiners, would ever get a license. I mean, why bother? The whole fun of it is making it illegally. This is the maguey, the agave plant from which Bacanora is made. 
This year, later on sometime, the plant will send up a shoot, its flower. The Bacanora makers will come by and lop that shoot off before it gets very tall and then wait for a couple of years. That concentrates the starches of the plant in the base. They'll come along then, pry the thing out of the ground, cut off all the leaves, and come away with a pineapple looking object that is the basis for making the best Bacanora in the world. The tradition of making Bacanora comes from our ancestors. The teachings have been passed down from generation to generation. We can plant and grow corn in the fields at the same time that we make Bacanora. My father taught me. I was just a young kid when I learned how to work the steel. It's a long process. It takes many days to produce the first batch. Before we can cook the agave in the oven, we let the pulp ferment in the barrel for up to eight or nine days. Then, we bring it over and fill up the oven. We add a started and then cover up the hole with a hollowed out palm trunk. This is the cap into which we insert the culebra or snake. The more patient you are, the better the bacanora is. If you hurry, the end product usually isn't worth anything. The production of bacanora is a lengthy process. It starts by going to the field and collecting the agave plants, bringing them into the binata, that is the place where bacanora is made, and then having several steps that involve the uh, uh, crushing the heads, allowing the fermentation to proceed. And the taste is a little sour, not the bacanora because it's very sweet, but the fermenting agave is sour. And then doing the destillation and usually a second destillation. What's coming out now is bacanora. Bacanora, the good stuff. Making bacanora is a long and complicated process. Somebody has to come forth at the end and test the final product. I volunteer. <laughs> ah, that's good. Bacanora is a Spanish institution. It's great stuff, but I came all this way to find the remnants of the native Opata. Buena Vista is an unlikely place for to have a you know, sort of center of weaving. It's got to be one of the most isolated villages in Sonora. Oh, it's a beautiful ride. I can't imagine how people reached Buena Vista say 100 years ago when Karl Lumholtz decided to come to these regions. But even now, it's probably a six or seven hour drive from Hermosillo. 250 people in the town is what um, the census data says. So it's way out here in the middle of nowhere. I guess it's the only place where the descendants of the Opatas uh, still weave. I think it's the only place in, uh, in, in all of Sonora. Because there's such a heavy demand on hats, uh, and I really wonder why is not more widespread. I don't know, but I think most of the women weave here. I've, I've been here a couple times before, but not for a long time. This is my first time in this town. Uh, Being a Sonoran is, is, is really bad, but it's so far away. I feel so happy of coming to this fabled town where sombreros are made. Because in Hermosillo, people have pride on owing a sombrero from, from Buena Vista. <laughs> Doña Maria, the woman who first introduced the hats to me nearly a decade ago, 
is gone. I was relieved to find that Doña Guadalupe, or Lupana as they call her, is still weaving with palm fibers. I was very young when I began to work, and I am still weaving to this day. My mother, my older sisters, and an aunt aprendimos a tejer taught me how to weave es que es mucho trabajo, it takes a lot of time to make Para hats like this one tanta palmita, mi... just look at all the fibers that go into it La palma. Es que aquí hay en, hay the palms are harvested in the hills that's where we palma. get all our materials This bundle cost me 50 cents. If we don't go out and harvest ourselves, we have to buy from the vendors to sell it in the village. People place an order for a hat or bottle covers like these. This one here is the finest material we work with. And this other one has a green stripe design from the same palm fibers. When it doesn't rain, it's still very pleasant inside the huki. We moisten the ground inside to create a humid climate, so the palm fibers get soft and pliable for weaving. So, it's always nice and humid inside here? Yes. It needs to be because it's very dry outside. But down here, the fibers become moist and soft. How long have you had this hooky? Oh, many, many years. You know, when it rains here, I can weave inside the house because of the higher humidity. But that doesn't happen very often. My grandfather was Opata. Mi abuelito, el papá de mi papá. My father's father. Pero de ahí vienen estos trabajos de... That is where, you know, the origin of this art form opata. comes from. The estos opatas. Estos tejidos son los que ellos... They passed on the weaving knowledge so that we would continue to trabajando. weave, which we still do to this day. Todavía trabajando. Son mis nietas. Those Para are my historia. grandchildren. Aprenden Hopefully they too will learn how to weave. Their mother weaves. Can you imagine how much work goes into this? Look at all these strands of fibers, and I'm not done yet. It is very time consuming, and I still have to do my housework. Here in the bottom of this hat is where I began, and slowly I spiral outward as it grew in shape. Sometimes it takes up to 15 days to finish a hat. These wadis are for large tortillas. This type of weaving is the easiest there is. This is the only way I can climb out of the hooky. Here's one of the bottles. And here's the second one. Is this wadi for flour tortillas? Yes, real big tortillas. And here is some more treasures of Buena Vista. The hooky is terrific. It's warm when it's cold outside, and it's very cool when it's hot outside. When it's uh, raining, she doesn't need to work in here because it's moist and she can work in the house. She uh, brings water into the platform in the back sprinkles it, it keeps the place moist, she can work there all year round if she needs to. And it's also, I'm sure, a refuge from all of the distractions and uh, other things that might happen and she can get away from it all. It's a great place. To be courteous, we should take off our hats before going inside the house and drinking the mezcal. I was here eight years ago and ten years ago, and I wrote down quite a bit of what I was told here. There's some that I didn't understand, and uh, there's a lot that I didn't get because I didn't ask the right questions. Just goes to show that the only way to find out about the life of the people in the Sierra, in the Obataria, and the arts that we're losing, is to go there and talk to them and find out what's happening. As long as the women can find a market for their products, they will continue to weave. 
and pass this skill on to their daughters and granddaughters. And this Opata tradition will survive. It's not unusual to find sand in a desert. Plenty of it too. But white sand? Or huge piles of sand with aspen growing on them? All a part of the unexpected world of sand dunes. Next time on The Desert Speaks. 56. Uh, a ver, ese va a ser pequeño. So ah. this is a 55. Al revés. And that al one, revés. al revés, no, no importa porque <laughs> así se queda encima. <laughs> es, creo que es, es un poco este pequeño. Un cuarto. A ver, uh, maybe this one. A ver, a ver. A ver. Ah. ¿Y de qué número es este? 58. Now this is a 58 and it should flop.